All right, so I'm going to start reading for you guys, and you guys can follow along. For first is amoeba. Take a look through a microscope at a drop of healthy pond water. You'll likely find a ton of one-celled organisms zooming about. Some of these cells move by fluttering tiny hair like cilia. Others propel themselves with whip-like flangella. You'll also come across blobbly cells that creep about and engulf other cells with other bodies. These one-celled critters are amoebas, and they move in and feed by extending a pseudopodia, false feet, to move. An amoeba reaches pseudophobia away from its edges and anchors from at their tips. The cells inside streams at, into the pseudophobia until the entire amoeba has slurped into a new place. Amoebas live all over from oceans to soil. They play an important ecological role by making meals of the huge number of bacteria, algae, and small protists found on the planet. One common amoeba is a giant amoeba, amoeba, amoeba proteus. Giant amoeba reproduce by binary fission, a fancy word that means splitting in two. When a giant amoeba begins to divide, it pulls its pseudophodia into a form and into a kind of a ball. After its nucleus doubles, the amoeba constricts in the middle as if a belt were being pulled tight around it. Finally, the two new cells pinch apart, send out the pseudophobia, and slink away from each other. In this way, two identical daughter cells are made from one. When conditions are right, this amoeba can divide every 48 hours. All right, next is brittle star. Peer into the hole of a sea sponge and you may catch a glimpse of the brittle star. These critters are tiny, only an inch or two across with arms stretched. They inhabit virtually all of the world's tropical and subtropical ocean habitats. Brittle stars are related to starfish. They have a similar body structure. The central disks, right here, hold all the important stuff like the mouth, the stomach, and the reproductive organs. They are the arms, long and slender, wavy and edged, with short spines. These arms are what give brittle stars their name. They can bre break off and regenerate. They take the regenerative step a step further. It actually splits in half to reproduce. When fission happens, the brittle star breaks down in the middle of its disc to make two identical three-armed halves. These half stars then grow into three new arms. But this isn't the only way it reproduces. Like all brittle stars, they also reproduce sexually. At certain times of the year, large females and males raise their discs off the surface, balance on their legs, and release sperm and eggs into the ocean. When the sperm and eggs meet, they make larvae that float into new habitats. Fission is the way, is the main way that they reproduce. But since they don't move far or fast, large groups of burial stars drone, uh, don't build up in one area. Scientists think sexual reproduction may help brittle stars move into new areas far from their clone-filled sponge homes. Grizzly bear. Grizzly bears used to roam throughout the Great Plains of North America. They hunted elk and moose and nibbled on berries and grasses. Grizzly bears still do these things, of course, but habitat loss and hunting have left the bears only in rough mountain, mountainous areas. Grizzly bears are enormous animals. They need large territories, especially when food is hard to find. Males can weigh as much as 453.6 kilograms, so 1,000 pounds. Females can clock in around 317.5 kilograms, about 700 pounds. A grizzly bear's territory can be as large as 906.5 square kilometers, 350 square miles. Though grizzlies spend most of their days wandering alone, they come together in early summer to mate. During mating, mating, the male deposits his sperm into the female, where they fertilize her eggs. Females delay implantation of the fertilized eggs 
until late fall. This way, the embryos don't begin to developing until the females are nestled into their warm dens. Mothers give birth eight weeks later between one and four cubs. Until they leave the den in late spring, the cubs live off their mom's milk. This means mom has to eat enough in the summer and fall to survive hibernation to feed her cubs too. Cubs stay with her mother for about three years. She won't reproduce again until they leave her side. Bears grow and reproduce slowly. This and their need for large territories with a lot of food makes grizzlies sensitive to overhunting and habitat loss. Thankfully, they are protected by the Endangered Species Act and many conservation and wildlife biologists. Red Kangaroo In the remote dry plains of Central Australia, mobs roam the countryside. But these aren't mobs to be feared. Mobs are, the, mobs are the official name for groups of red kangaroos. An unlikely angry mob of people, red kangaroos are skittish and will scatter when frightened. When they're really moving, red kangaroos can leap as far as 3.7 meters in one jump and reach speeds of 56 kilomiles per hour. So 34, about 35 miles per hour. Red kangaroos are one of the largest marsupials. Herbivorous mobs are, of them bounce off eating grass and other vegetation. Mobs are usually led by the m most mature female and include lots of other females and young kangaroos called joeys. When it's mating time, males will continue will sometimes box each other for females with their powerful legs. The winning male deposits his sperm in the female where it fertilizes an egg. After mating, females just stay for about 33 days. So um, humans do nine months. So this is three, 33 days, about a month. Then give birth to one baby kangaroo. Young red kangaroos are born very undeveloped. Like most marsupials, they will spend a lot of time growing in their mom's pouches. Through tiny pink hair, uh, hairless and blind, the newborns know to head straight for the pouch. It swims through the mom's fur to get there, then attaches to the nipple and finishes developing. So it's right here in the picture. After about seven months, a joey outgrows mom's pouch and leaves to bounce around next to her. Once this happens, the mom gives birth to another tiny pink baby. Females can continuously give birth. They usually have about three joeys every two years. There, this is salmonella. There are times when we eat something and our stomach hurts, and then there are times when it really hurts badly. When it hurts, deadful bacteria, ba deadfully bad and include fever, nausea, and diarrhea, this could be food poisoning. Yick! And that's a mild case of food poisoning. Some of the more life-threatening cases can, be, can send a person to the hospital. The interesting thing is it's not not it's not poisonous at all sorry it is the result of a sinister bacteria known as salmonella this one-celled rod-shaped bacteria is fairly common it can be found naturally in raw eggs raw meats on the bodies of some reptiles and in animal feces Poop. when salmonella finds itself in warm growth chambers of our bodies that it hits pay dirt when salmonella reaches our small intestine, it begins to make copies of itself through simple division. These bacteria can continue to rapidly divide, increasing the number and infecting other cells. It takes about 12 to 72 hours to feel the effects of salmonella invasion. Our immune system responds, but salmonella does a good job of fending it off. Our bodies can fight off some salmonella infections, but we often need antibiotics to overcome them. Thankfully, salmonella is not one of those ex extreme bacteria that can survive the freezing temperatures of the Arctic or boiling heat of volcanic thermal vents. We can kill salmonella by cooking, pasteurizing, or freezing our foods and drinks. Still, salmonella infection is common enough. It usually turns up when people aren't washing their hands or cooking meat thoroughly. Six. Spine spiny water flea. There's a tiny transparent crustacean that swims jerkily around in the Great Lakes. It spikes fish in the mouth with long tail and gobbles up microscopic aquatic animals. It's called the tiny water flea, but it's more related to crabs and 
and lobsters than to insects. Though other kinds of water fleas are common in ponds and streams, the spiny water flea is not a welcome visitor. It's an invader from European waters and it competes with local fish and water fleas for food. Its defense is its nasty barbed tail, which makes up 70% of its two centimeter long body. Spiny water fleas are a threat to ecosystems, in part because they reproduce rapidly. Like all water fleas, this one alternates between asexual and sexual phases. Most of the time, a female produces eggs without fertilization. She releases about 10 eggs into the brood chamber of her back. They develop over several days, and then the young clone hatch. In warm days of summer, females can make a batch of clones every two weeks. When food is scarce or temperatures drop, some females produce spiny little males. The males mate with females that have produced special eggs used for fertilization. Once fertil once fertilize, these so-called resting eggs leave the mom and stay dormant until conditions approve. Resting eggs can survive drying or being eaten by a fish. Spiny water fleas seem to have a lot on their side and they're in the Great Lakes to stay. Still, biologists are working hard to keep them from spreading into more lakes. Last one. Desert Grassland Whiptail Lizard. Things are not always what they seem in the world of rep reproduction. Take example of the desert grassland whiptail, a lizard that lives in the southwest United States. These lizards have long sleep bo bodies with lines from nose to tail. They race around in dry leaves and branches, eating termites, grasshoppers, beetles, and other insects. Like the lizards, the whiptails perform courtship, mate, and lay eggs. Sounds pretty or ordinary, right? But if we took a closer look, we'd find out that not a single one of the lizards is a male. This is all female whiptail species can reproduce without fertilization, a process called parthenogenesis. Pairs of females take turns playing male during courtship and mating. If the female is interested, the male will wrap around her tail and grip his jaw of her body. The couple will stay like this for five to ten minutes. This is called pseudocopulation or false mating. No actual males or sperm are involved. The female from this mating pair lay two to three eggs, which all hatch into copies of their mom. Females will mate and lay about three times over the breeding season. It turns out that females who lay eggs after mating with another female lay more eggs than females who don't mate. Laying a few more eggs is definitely an advantage in the harsh desert where survival is very difficult.